time to hear your voice, Lord. We invite you to speak to not just our hearts, but our minds as well. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So I went to the dentist this week. Uh, they told me it had been 12 years since my last visit. I'm not an anti-dentite. I just want to make that clear, all right? Uh, I, I, I don't like the dentist, but, you know, if I need to go, I need to go. So we went as a family, right? The, 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 the person at the dentist's office is like, oh, yeah, we'll just take care of you guys all at the same time. And I'm, I'm imagining us all holding hands while we're in the dentist chair, right? Kind of like that old cartoon where they've got all those hoses going into your mouth, and they're saying, Mr. Morgan, just out of curiosity, we're going to see if we can put this tennis ball in there as well, right? So I'm at the dentist, right? We walk in, and, um, you know, all of a sudden my wife plays the pastor card. Oh, my, my husband's a pastor, right? And uh, I love being a pastor, but as soon as you reveal your vocation, you get all sorts of, of questions and people asking you things. And so the receptionist right there is like all of a sudden burying her soul, like she's been divorced, she was married for 25 years, she was divorced, she's got adult children, and, uh, you know, she's talking about the church excommunicating her because she's a Catholic and because of her divorce. I'm like, that's so sad. And, and then she wanted to shift gears and talk about the Illuminati. <laughs> right? We're filling out all of our patient paperwork, right? She wants to buy a, the Illuminati. So, you know, so we talked about that. And I said, I fully trust the Illuminati. No, not, not really. But so she wanted to talk about the Illuminati. She's curious, right? She's confused. And so we're talking about the Illuminati. And then I get called to go back and then. I'm in the chair, and all of a sudden, the, the lady that's cleaning my teeth, I, I would say she was pickaxing my teeth. I mean, it was like, boom, boom, like, Mr. Morgan, there's so much plaque and stuff on here. And I had just eaten popcorn, and I had my coffee that morning. So, um, <laughs> hey, I'm going to make these people earn every m bit of money they, they get. So, um, so all of a sudden, she's, she's, you know, oh, you're a pastor. And she says, yeah, well, I was at a church in Prescott one time at this bridal shower, and all of a sudden everyone started speaking in tongues. What's your position on this? So I'm like, well, you got to get your foot out of my mouth for me to answer this question. So she wanted to talk about spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues. Right? So we go from Illuminati to speaking in tongues. Then I get done, and I go out to the reception area. There's a single mom out there with four foster children, and she's talking about a church that's welcoming to all people. By that she means, how does your church respond to the LGBTQWAV community out there? Uh, and so now we're having to discuss. Man, I, I wasn't just worn out from my oral exam. I was, I was worn out spiritually, right? And, and I walked out of there. I didn't want to go to the dentist in the first place. And God showed me, Scott, there's a reason why you're going to the dentist. And it's more about cleaning your teeth. And we're talking, I'm having three conversations, separate topics with three separate people about things that they're confused by. Here are people with real life questions, real life confusion, and they're not having them answered by anybody. And all of a sudden, Pastor Scott shows up and it's time to talk about these things. I get it at the coffee house. Just a couple weeks ago, some guy walked up to me with his Bible and said, you're a pastor, right? How do you interpret this verse? And I just realized that there's a world that's confused. And not just the world out there, we're confused as well. And what I thank God for is his truth. Something you can believe in, something you can bank your life on, something where we live in an environment where oftentimes we don't know who can be trusted and what's reality and what is truth. Well, there's one thing that I've devoted my life on, and that is communicating what God says in his word, because it can be taken to the bank. It is, it is true. It is reliable. And boy, how much has this come out through the minor prophets? That words spoken 2,500 years ago are relevant for today. And we close with relevant truth for our lives today. Malachi, the final book of the Old Testament, the final book of the prophets, the final voice of God to, to the people, to remind them of what's important. And so Malachi leaves us with some things to consider. And there's two major points this morning I want us to talk about. Number one, the message of God's rebuke. And we talked about this two weeks ago because God has a lot to say to us and it comes in the form of rebuke but rebuke always has its aim in healing and restoring. 
Sometimes God has to say a hard thing to us to wake us out of our stupor. Sometimes God has to shake us and say, wake up to reality, folks. Here are the things you really need to live your lives focused on. Because sometimes we get distracted, right? And then he closes with a message of God's promises. The message of hope for anyone who's willing to follow him. For anyone who's willing to to put their love and their hope and their trust in him. He closes with a word of, of, of wonderful promises for God's people. So there's a lot to unpack here. Let's dive in. We're going to look at the last verse of chapter 2, verse 17, as we look at three important things when it comes to God rebuking his people on top of the three other things we looked at last time. And so we talked about uh, empty, worthless worship last time. We talked about indifference. We talked about meaningless marriages, and those are some of the things that that Malachi dealt with in chapter 1, chapter 2. But the three things I want to look at under this point are, number one, wearying God. Number two, robbing God. Number three, insulting God. He rebukes his people because they have gotten to a point where they're wearying him. He rebukes his people because there's a point where they are robbing him. And finally, in this section, they are insulting him and we ask ourselves just like the questions that are poised to us in the book of malachi 27 questions are asked and we come to a place in verse 17 of chapter 2 where the writer says this you have wearied the lord with your words yet you say how have we wearied him In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. So that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. As in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be swift against a witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Let's stop right there. Four things we need to unpack in how the people are wearying the Lord. And we think to ourselves, how can the Lord get weary? Well, I would imagine as, as a parent, right, when your kids continue to do things over and over and over again that you've told them not to do, has any parent ever been there before? Good, I'm in a safe place. I, you know what this like, right? It's like, you know, hauntings of my mom when I was young saying, how many times do I have to tell you? Over and over and over again. Just the other day, I was, uh, I was on top of my kids on, about something, and, and I said, I just need to record in my phone the message and just play it because I'm tired of wasting my breath. Right? How have we wearied the Lord? Well, the Lord cannot get weary, but this is revealing his heart to a people where he's told them time and time again what he expects of them, and they continue to do otherwise. See, the, f- the first point is having to do with cynicism. And there's a frustration with delayed punishment that is communicated in verse 17 of chapter 2. Because here's what the people are witnessing. They're saying, God, we're trying to live uprightly. And yet all of our neighbors, everyone who doesn't know you seems to be blessed and we're not getting anything. You know, where's that law of retribution playing out, Lord? Because they're doing evil and being blessed and we're doing good and we're not getting any blessing. And they're frustrated because they want God to bring judgment, kind of like the disciples, right? When they came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, they're ignoring us over there. Can we cast down fire from heaven right now? 
This is not a good way to share the love of Jesus with people, just FYI. But they're saying, we are frustrated and they've grown cynical, so their conclusion is, well, why should we live righteously and we're not getting anything when they're living unrighteously and it seems like they're getting blessed? So they've adopted this cynical mindset where they say, you know what, is it even worth it? Is it even worth it to honor the Lord? Because it doesn't seem like we're getting anything out of it. Write this verse down. This is an interesting verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. The, 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 the wisdom of Solomon comes out and it says this. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. When you just sit back and go, why does it seem like the bad and evil prosper and those who are trying to do good and be righteous don't prosper? Is it even worth it to live for the Lord? I mean, at the end of the day, what's what's in it for me? Because it seems like they're getting blessed and I'm not. And you need to be careful. You need to be careful because you need to realize something. And this is something that I continue to have to embrace every single day is that your reward for righteousness may not be paid here. Your reward for obedience in honoring God may not be rewarded this side of eternity. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. He says, do not, do not ever think your labor for Christ is ever in vain. You're going you're gonna to hear this truth once again in, in, in chapter 4. But you need to be reminded that Jesus himself in Matthew 5 says, don't worry, your reward is in heaven. If you're looking for reward this side of eternity, you may be waiting a long time. May the reward itself be just a heart that says, I'm going to honor God no matter how other people are responding, no matter what other people are receiving, no matter how other people are acting. I'm going to honor God and I'm going to stick true to to what God wants for me and I'm going to trust his promise that he will reward those who live for him. Amen? We need to be reminded of this, man. I tell you what, because it is easy to throw in the towel. And if you want God to bring judgment on on the enemies, you better be careful. Because look how God responds in verse 1 of chapter 3. He says this, I am going to send my messenger, and he's going to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and, and, and don't worry, he's coming. This is God kind of rhetorically saying like, oh, you want me, you want me to come? Well, guess who I'm going to arrive to first? My people. First Peter chapter 4 says judgment will begin with the house of God. What? See, we're so quick to point the finger at what everyone else is doing. The message of Malachi, the message of Scripture is before you start judging others, you better take a quick look at your own heart. Because he's going to come and he's going to judge you. And this comes to our, 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 our second point, which is this. There's a blessing of future purification. So you need to understand that we are to live in light of the Lord's coming. Martin Luther said it this way. There are only two days on my calendar. This day and that day. Right? I've got right now. And I do know that the Lord's coming back at some point, so those are the only two important dates on my calendar, so I'm going to live in anticipation for that day. Because just like he said he was coming, and verse 1 is an allusion to the, the, the first arrival of Jesus, and who prepared the way for the coming Messiah? John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist is the one I come to prepare a way in the wilderness, quoting Isaiah chapter 40. And behold, he's, he pointed at Jesus coming through to be baptized and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, this is an allusion to, to what was going to happen yet future. But we need to realize that just because Jesus came the first time, he also talked about the second coming. The fact that he is going to come back and he's going to evaluate every person's work. 
And I'm going to tell you something. I, I was convicted by a, a quote this week that goes like this. Examination of works today is better of elimination of blessings tomorrow. I want the Lord to examine me. I want him to inspect my heart. I want him to see where I'm at. Because I, before I start judging people, I better evaluate my own heart. Why am I doing what I'm, do, what I'm doing? Am I only doing things for God that I'm expecting reward for? Am I only doing things that I want him to bless me for? Am I just do, have I not realized that he has already given me the greatest gift, and the greatest gift is him sending his son? And how dare we go to him as like insolent children, like, you know what, God, yeah, you gave me your, your son, but you know what, I'm demanding more. And we ought to take to, to heart the words of Romans 8. If he has given you his own son, how dare we question that he's going to take care of us for all the rest of this stuff? Has he given us all? Then why do we go to him as spoiled children? Has he given us all? Then why do we go to him demanding more? Look at our hearts. Be content with where he has you. If you have Christ, you have it all. If you have Christ, you have all the treasures in the world. If you have Christ, you have all the wisdom in the world. If you have Christ, you have all that matters for time and eternity. Get your eyes off your neighbors and what they're accumulating and focus on what you have. God's going to purify us. It says it. He says in in chapter 2, he's coming in like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. What do these images mean? It means that the fire comes to purify and make pure. The fuller soap comes to wash and make clean. These are not destroying phrases. He's not coming to destroy us, but his present work is to purify us. And he will ultimately purify us so that one day we can stand with him in glory forever and ever and ever. Amen? Every part of our our old nature, every part of our sinful past, every part of our sinful present will be taken care of because of the faithful work of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to live in preparation so that I make his job of purifying easier in the future. Because we get dirty, don't we? We get stained by the world and we get impacted and influenced negatively by the world and sometimes we allow that stuff to stick on us. And I want to live righteously today so that when I stand before him in glory and he looks at my life, I'm allowing his work of of making me spot-free, wrinkle-free, that much easier for the Holy Spirit in me now. Amen? So there's a blessing of future purification that's awaiting every son and daughter of the Most High. Which then leads us to our third point. There's people that don't care about the coming there's, there's people who don't care about the way they live their lives now. And there's a sense of false security because, you know, they're God's people, quote unquote. We're part of this tribe. We're part of this nation. And God says, I've never, ever promised eternal security to those who just can claim some sort of earthly heritage, some sort of earthly legacy. Remember, the Bible says not all who are of Israel are of Israel. The Abraham, uh, offspring of Abraham, according to Paul, says, are those that have experienced the heart circumcision. The good news is for us today, it doesn't matter how many times you go to church. So some of you that are keeping track on your calendars, throw it away. It doesn't matter how many times you help people. It doesn't matter how many times you read your Bible. It doesn't matter how many, Those things are all important, but so many times we forget about position in light of our performance. And God is angry with present practices he says to these people i'm coming and i'm going to judge your work because you are acting like sorcerers you're against you're acting like adulterers you're acting uh, as those who swear falsely you're you're oppressing the wage earner these are people that have no sense of reverence for god or how they treat other human beings God throughout the scripture says, I care for the widows, I care for the orphans, I care for the poor, I care for the foreigners and strangers and aliens, and you cannot even love one another, therefore you're not loving those outside your camp. And he says, don't tell me you love me when you have disregard for each other. This is what 1 John's about. You love God, you're going to love your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, you're not loving God. And so God is angry, right? They're divorcing their wives. They're marrying foreign women. God says, I hate divorce. I hate the way you're acting. Now you're borrowing the practices of the world. And guess what? There are practices for the believer in God that are different than the practices of the world. 
you are different. If you're in Christ, you are different. And how that difference comes out is how we treat one another. How we love one another. Story this week. Atlantic Ocean. Family too far out in the ocean. Two small kids and an elderly woman. Woman screaming on the beach frantically. My my family! They're drowning! And all of a sudden people start clamoring on the beach. and They're looking, they're 300 feet out and the tide's taking them out. Two small kids and an elderly woman. They're looking around, they're like, who's got a rope? And they're like, that's not one of the things you bring to the beach. When you go to the beach, you're not bringing a rope. And all of a sudden they decide, here, hold my hand. And then you hold my hand. All of a sudden they form a human chain from the beach out into the deepest part of the ocean. And they save all three people. Why? Because they formed a chain of community. No one knows each other, but they know there's lives at stake. They form the chain. They rescue everybody. They get back on the beach. There's an applause like, we did good. And then everyone went their separate ways as if nothing had happened. Is that awesome? I'm sitting going, yes. We are to care for our neighbor. We're to care for the foreigner. We're to care for the widow and the orphans and the oppressed. We're not to take advantage of people. We're to love as Jesus loved. And I don't care how they vote. And I don't care what God they believe in. I care about the formation of Christ in you and how you respond to people. And maybe, just maybe, you have a chance to rescue them. And throw them that wonderful life preserver called Jesus Christ who can save from all calamity. Then, maybe then, you will begin to honor God in your lives. How we treat one another is of the utmost importance, and God is quick to remind us of this. These people had forgotten it. They're taking advantage of each other. And God says, beware, I'm bringing judgment, and I'm starting with you. The good news is, if you're not in that camp, you're going to escape that judgment. Amen? But the other part of the good news is, if you're not there, God's message today is you can get there. That's why, look at verse 6 and 7 in this, this section of chapter 3. For I, the Lord, do not change. Circle that. This is what we call in, in theological circles God's immutability. He does not change. His character is constant. The way he works is constant. And we need to be encouraged by this because he says, from the days of your father, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Now listen to this. Return to me. Invitation. It's never too late to do what's right. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. But you say, how shall we return? Man, I just want to Jesus slap these people. You ever heard of the Jesus slap? Who wants a demonstration right now? Come on. No, just kidding. I've never Jesus slapped anybody in my life. Jesus kick, maybe, but Jesus slap, never. But notice how God is committed to relational permanence. It is never too late to do what's right because here's what you have on the receiving end. A God who never changes in his unfailing faithful love to you that says come to me come to me i want you to know and perhaps this is a word for for several of you this morning you can never sin yourself outside the grace of god amen you can never sin so much where you're beyond the reach of god's love this is an invitation where god says as i've acted throughout the ages i still act today i'm faithful to who i am and my character but my covenant love for you does not change If you change your lives, you're going to find in me a constant God who's going to love you and forgive you. If you choose to honor me, guess what? I'm still here. I haven't left. Even though the people are like, you know what, God? We've been doing all the right things. Yeah, you've been doing the right things for the wrong reasons. He says, return to me. And something can be restored. This is an amazing promise. That we have a God who doesn't change, who daily says, return to me. Is that awesome or what? 
I mean, why do we act the way we do when we have a God who promises faithful covenant love like this? Why? So God, final point is that commitment to relational permanence. God is faithful when we're unfaithful. God is always there when we think he's not present at all. You know that feeling of distance that sometimes we experience wondering if God's even there? has nothing to do with him leaving. It has to do with all the sin and all the unrighteousness blocking our view of his glory. We've erected a wall. And I'm going to pull an old 1989, tear down that wall! God is not in the walls. Some of you are like, is that a Trump illusion? Are you getting political? No. No. Because the wall of unrighteousness and sin that we erect causes this break in fellowship that God's saying, no, I don't want that. Live for me. Love me, love others with all your heart, and you know what? We're good. Now God gets really specific. He says, you want to know how you return to me? Stop robbing me. He starts dealing with money. And I'm faithful to my promise. Two weeks ago, we said, we're going to talk about this. Some of us are like, oh, great. This is one of those churches. Always talking about money. You, you want to know why money is important? Because it's one of the most talked about topics in the Bible. It's why one of the teachings of Jesus says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Look at verse 8. Will a man rob God? Now, how do we rob God? You are robbing me, but you say, how we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me out now in this, says the Lord. If, you, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. This is the only time in Scripture where God says, go ahead, test me. We're going to see why this is important here in a moment. Then I will rebuke the devourer. For you, so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor your vine in the field, with when it casts its grapes, and all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let me just let me just deal with this. I'm not going to go into this at length like I usually do. I usually do like a three, four part series every year on on generosity. But I want you to kind of wrap your mind around the thinking of what's going on in scripture when it comes to, to stewardship and money. I'm going to ask you a question. What in this world belongs to you and what in this world belongs to God? If you answered correctly, nothing belongs to you, ding, 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 you win a prize. Because naked you came into this world, and how are you going to leave? Naked. And everything, yeah. Amen for nakedness. Yeah, good. Everything you have has been given to you. And the most important thing that's been given to you is your very life. The biblical assumption is, knowing that not even your life is yours and it was given to you as a gift, you live your whole life for the glory of God. And when you live your whole life for his glory, everything else comes with it. But for some reason, there's this lie that's crept into humanity that says, no, it's all yours. You do with it what you want. How I conduct my life, how I conduct my business, how I conduct my sex, how I conduct my spending, how I conduct, it all is mine. And then, you know what, if there's something left over, I'll I'll just give it to, to the Lord. It's kind of a little nod like, hey, thanks, buddy. You're, you're really looking out for me, if there's anything left. The assumption is this, Romans 12. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your lives as a holy living sacrifice. That's why Jesus talked about the, the, the core of who you are as a person. Because I'm not interested in how much you give. I'm interested in why you give what you give. 
And when you realize it's all been given to you, first and foremost, from the, from the maker and creator of everything, you gladly avail yourself and your resources to him, and you go, God, how do you want to use what you've given to me? How do you want to use my body? How do you want to use my life? How do you want to use my mind, my heart? How do you want me to use the resources, my home, my car, my finances? See, this is not just about money. This is about all resources that ultimately do not belong to us. And he says, you're robbing me because, number one, you haven't given me your lives. You think empty, ritualistic worship is the answer. I'm not impressed. He says, but when you are demonstrating this attitude where it all belongs to the Lord, then I know I've got your heart. Because at the end of the day, you know what it is? It's an issue of trust. Write that word down. And some of you are like, I'm a very untrusting person. I know, that's why you're here today. Because if you can't trust God, how do you think you're going to live for His glory? If you can't trust God, how do you know what Jesus did on the cross for you is even, even worth it? How do you know He's even got a, a, a concern for your future? How do you know He's even got eternity prepared for you? You can't go through life doubting if God's going to take care of you. You're here. He's provided you salvation. He's given you Jesus. He's a God you can trust. And the greatest evidence of this is how we entrust to him 100% of all we have. Because according to Philippians chapter 4, I know my God will provide for all my needs according to, example, all the riches that he has for us in Christ Jesus. How rich is that? That's beyond understanding. I love the the story of Sam Houston, soldier, politician in Texas, right? He came to know Jesus, and he went to the church and says, I'm, I, I want Jesus, I want to be saved. And they're like, cool. And he was baptized, and he was celebrating it, and he stepped up, and he says, I want to pay for the pastor's salary. And people are like, why would you want to do that? And he says, because God baptized my pop- pocketbook too. Right? There's not an area of your life that God has not saved. There's not an area of your life that God has not redeemed. And he's saying to us now, people, how are you leveraging all that you have for my glory? Because his glory, his kingdom is what matters. Jesus taught this, seek first the kingdom of of heaven. And his righteousness and all other things are going to be taken care of. You see how the Bible just continues to point to this reality. And, and reminder, he's promised to take care of all your needs, not all your greed. Just remember that. How are you robbing me? Because you're not honoring me. And you're suffering because your crops are failing you. See, their crop failure is a result of their disobedience. And I alluded to this two weeks ago. If you don't honor God from the first fruits of your income, from the first fruits of your labor, from the first fruits of, of what God is blessing you with, God has this amazing way of turning circumstances so that you start spending money. You're like, wow, why did I get this in expense? Why did my car break down? Why did my air conditioning go out? God saying, I'm trying to wake you up so that you don't put your trust in money. You put your trust in Him. And your giving is a reflection of how much you trust God. Who wants to compare checkbooks right now? Let's bust them out. I know, that's old school. Okay, let's go with bill pay online. Look at your finances. How do your, ref- how do your finances reflect your trust in God to provide for you? That's a great question. Thank you. I just, just came up with it myself. Because here's what you find. A God who says, test me in this. You need to understand that there's a perpetual obedience he wants from his kids that leads to perpetual blessing that comes from him that then leads to perpetual influence and impact in this world. Notice what's said here in Malachi. Go ahead and test him because when you are perpetually obedient to what God wants, he's going to open up the storehouse of blessings upon you. You're going to receive his perpetual blessing. And I want you to know how rich God is. You will never exhaust God's riches. And you know what happens is when you live in obedience and then all of a sudden God's blessing you, 
the world around you is going to take notice and go, why are you content? Why are you blessed? Why is God taking care of you? And that's what he says here in verse 12. And all those nations are going to call you blessed. Who's calling you blessed? If no one's calling you blessed, then God's probably not blessing. And if you're not being blessed, you're probably not obedient. So what's the problem? Now, I'm not going, I'm not going all health, wealth, prosperity on you guys. Okay? Lori is not getting this big hairdo, and she's not going to overdo it with makeup. And I'm not going to come to you with $10,000 suits. Maybe. That would be kind of fun. Who wants to buy me one? Just kidding. But I am going to tell you this. That sometimes God does bless you materially. But the one blessing that God always gives is the Spirit speaking to our spirit, saying, well done, you've been obedient. And that confirmation from the Spirit is blessing enough. Amen? So don't, don't confuse what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that God can't bless you materially. He may. But just the blessing of your heart being blessed by God saying you well done good and faithful child that is blessing enough amen all right my wife was worried because I was going to talk about money was that okay oh thank you I like your hair today third insulting God verse 13 your words have been arrogant against me says the Lord yet you say what we have what have we spoken against you and you have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is there that we have kept his charge? And what have we walked in uh, mourning before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. Sound familiar? He's already been dealing with this. And you're insulting God. When you have your n- eyes on the world, when you have your eyes on your neighbor, and you, and you get envious. Because it seems like they're doing well, they're excelling, and yet you are doing what God wants you to do? Has God not done enough for you? Plus, the problem here with their hearts is that they basically are like, have we not been through the, the religious parade? Have we not gone through all the acts of mourning, Lord? And he's just going, yeah, you don't get it. I'm not concerned about your performance. I want your heart. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And so we insult God when we think he's impressed with empty formalism. We insult God when we think he's impressed with meaningless worship. You know what God delights in? A heart that is wholly yielded to him. A heart that says, God... If you give me Jesus and you don't give me anything else, I will still praise you. You know what doesn't insult God? Is complaining and grumbling and bitching about what you have or you don't have. And he's sitting there going, here's the cross. What more do you want? You know what insults God? Is a heart of discontentment. That just says, I'll be happy if. Really? God does not care about your happiness. That's a good tweet right there. He cares about your holiness. He doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your contentment. He doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your righteousness. He, you think it was happy that Jesus went to the cross? You think he was happy that he's bearing the sins of the world? Don't give me this theology of happiness. That is so infected the churches. You know how it's infected the churches when people go, you know what, uh, I'm just not getting anything out of this. I'm going to go look for something else. Good luck. We have this self-centered, ev- inve- uh, individualistic, materialistic, consumeristic culture, and it's crept into the church, and God help us. Because we are not a caterer of goods and services. Amen? And the person that says they're not getting anything out of it, my first question is, well, what are you putting into it? Because I can go to the ATM all day long and go, withdraw! And the banker's like, "Uh, have you made any deposits? I'm like, no, but I want something. 
Well, guess what? If you're not making deposits, you're not getting anything out. Take that to church. Take that to your marriage. Take that to your kids. Take that to your work. If you're not getting anything out of it, you're not putting anything in. Where's the impetus? It's not on them. It's on you. I love when people are like, I'm just not getting fed. I'm just not getting anything out of it. I'm just almost like, there's the door. I mean, I hate to come across callous and insensitive, but you know what? That person one year from now, they're not going to be happy anywhere. You know why? Because it's all about them. All I know is the Bible speaks of contentment, especially 1 Timothy 6. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Boy, I want to get that. I want to get there. Walking in obedience, being content with where I'm at, with what God has given to me or not given to me, I'm okay with it. Boy, there, Paul says there's great gain in that. Not great gain back there, but great gain. That joke never gets old, does it? I've known those guys for 10, 12 years, and it's like, you've probably heard it hundreds of times. Let's close with some words of, of affirmation and encouragement. Some of you who are a little bit more on the feels side of things need this. Number three things I want to con- remind you re- regarding God's promises. Number one, there's blessing for those who fear God. There's blessing for those who love God. There's blessing for those who hope in God. Fear of God, love for God, hope in God. Look how, look how Micah fin- Malachi finishes this. Oh, I love this. This is good. All right, so then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. So now there's a shift. God's watching people who are going, maybe this crusty prophet has something to say to us. Right? Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, so they're talking to each other. You ever thought about the fact that God is watching our interactions with each other? And maybe that delights us. Maybe that scares some of us. But isn't it cool that they start talking to one another and the Lord gave attention and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord who esteem his name. There is something wonderful about books that God has in his library throughout the scripture. Did you know the Bible says there's at least four books in God's library? So now I don't feel like such a nerd because I got a lot of books. I love books. My, my addiction, perhaps the show Intervention needs to come to my house after a while. I go to that VNSA book sale down at the Coliseum in February. It's like crack in book form. I, lo- I love it. Awesome. But God has a library. And the Bible says there's a library containing the books of who has eternal destiny with him and who doesn't, found in Revelation chapter 13. There's a book of sins that are recorded, found in the, the book of Isaiah. There's a book of, of judgments coming that spoken of in, in Revelation. So there's this idea that God writes things in books, but this is the only instance where there's this book of remembrance written down, and you need to know why this is historically important, is because kings would write down the good acts of their subjects, and he'd make notes. So they write down your name, they write down the good act, so that when you needed something, they would take care of you because of what you had done for them. There's this book of remembrance when he says, when I look upon my people and they do good things, I'm going to keep track of that because I want to be a God who rewards my people. Awesome. So he keeps this book of remembrance. And one day he's going to, he's going to probably share this book with you and say, can I just tell you how much it meant to me that you, my child, honored me in your life? Honored me with your money, honored me with your, your, your purity, honored me with your work ethic, honored me with how you loved your wife or your husband? He, God knows. God's keeping track. Is that good to hear? Is that what may go unnoticed by the world never goes unnoticed by God? Oh, that's encouraging. Because sometimes it feels like a lonely journey. Does anyone even recognize? You know, it's it's human of us to want that, that pat on the back and those accolades, but God says, I'm watching. So he's got this book of remembrance. He's writing down all those who fear him and and who esteem him. And then the fear of the Lord is continued here in verse um. One, uh, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. See, this idea of fearing the Lord is the idea of having incredible reverence for Him. You don't treat God like He's your next door buddy. There is an aspect of God's love where, where, love where He is our friend, 
but we never treat him as that man upstairs or, you know, he's just that good old grand divine papa and whatever words we use. He is a God who created everything. I, I live with reverence towards that sort of power. So when you fear the Lord, you honor him. Because you know how powerful he is. How mighty and majestic he is. So when you fear the Lord, it's a good thing. Verse 2, you fear my name. And guess what happens for those who fear his name? The son of righteousness will, will rise with healing in its wings. And you're going to go forth skipping and jumping like calves that have just been born. And you're going to tread down the wicked under your feet. Notice how awesome this is. For those who fear God, there's, two, there's promises here. Number one, you're going to have unimaginable joy. And number two, you're going to experience complete victory. If you live in light of how amazing our God is and you revere Him, and that comes into how you conduct yourself. I'm not going to treat the gift of salvation lightly. I'm not going to approach God with the spirit of license. Well, I'm saved, so I can just do whatever I want. No. And I'm not going to go from license to legalism where I'm so uptight about following God that I, I lose the spirit of the law because I'm following the letter of the law. But he says, I'm going to reward you, and you're going to be like those calves. Have you ever watched that nature show? I watch these nature shows with my kids, right? And there's a baby animal that pops out of the mom, falls to the ground, all messy, and they get up, and they're like, Aah! you know, it's like, what? They're so excited to be alive, right? And they just, they're trying to get their feet, but they're jumping. And we just watched a video of a, a baby rhino jumping around like a crazy animal. And, and I'm like, that's the picture God says. Like, when you watch that, he says, when you, when you witness the birth, and you experience the joy of something so innocent, that's what you're going to experience because you feared me. And when you fear me, you need to know that I've got utter victory in my hands and there's nothing that the world can do to you to take away the gift of life and healing that's going to come through Jesus Christ. Number two, love for me. Go back to verse 17 of chapter 3. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day, I'll prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his only son who serves him. And you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not. So again, there's this idea, there's those who love God and there's those who don't. There, there's, there's no confusing the two. You're either for him or you're against him. But for those who are for him, who love him, he says, you are my treasured possession. You, you want to know why this is good? It's because the treasured possession is kind of like the, the, the safety security box you have at your bank. Like it's different from your savings account, right? You have money that's saved and, you know, you're saving for one thing or another. But then there's things that you have that you can't put a numeric monetary value on that you put in a safety security box. And God says, you are in my safety security box. You're that important. And I sit there and go, wow. In, in a world that wants to minimize the purpose and significance and value of man, God elevates us at a level and he says, you are created in my image. You have intrinsic value. You are the apex of my creation, Psalm chapter 8. Therefore, not only is man and woman important in my eyes, but the man and woman who loves me is my treasured possession, and you are in my safety security box. That's awesome. And I sit there and go, thank you, God, for making me your special treasure. Because I don't deserve it. But God's given it to me, and I am blessed. So you know what I want to do because of that value that's been placed upon me? I want to live reflecting that value. And perhaps one of the greatest areas of testing in my own life is the third point where it's hoping in God. Because I can celebrate what he's done for me in the past, and I can celebrate what he's doing for me in the, in the present, but to trust him for what is yet to come, that's a whole other topic. 
And he says here to finish this out, verse 4, remember the law of Moses? Verse 5, remember Elijah the prophet? Look how the Old Testament's closing. Remember the law and the prophets. Jesus comes 400 years later. I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. You see how 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew in our Bible is now all of a sudden bridged by what's important, the totality of God's word, the totality of Scripture, how the Old Testament is important with the work of Christ, how the New Testament is the blossoming flower uh, of the seeds that are planted in the Old Testament. Pay attention to the law and the prophets. Verse 6, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. There's going to be this reconciliation that happens. And what happens? Jesus comes. And all of a sudden, there's, there's no more of a fracture in our relationship between us and God. And Jesus comes, and then there's lives that are transformed and, and marriages that were on the brink of disaster that are now healing. And there's family units that are, were on the brink of, of dissolution and God's bringing them together. And there's friendships that are made whole. And there's churches that are no longer being separated over dumb things like cherry pies and potlucks. But there are people that are coming together because God is not a God of division, but God is a God who brings unity when Christ works, He brings restoration. And then He closes. Because you're thinking, man, this is good. I, I wish it stopped there. But you know what the last word is in the Bible, in the Old Testament? Curse. You want to know why? Because this is where God puts it in your hands. He says, I've, I've told you up to this point everything you, you need to know. But if you disregard what I've shared with you, there's a curse. The question is, what are you going to do with what God's shown you? I, I mean, I wish I could live your life for you. I've got enough trouble just living my own, amen? But you are called to now do something. God says, go live for my glory. Go live for my honor. Go live and have me in your view, front and center. Allow me to define your life. Allow me to define your work. Allow me to, to have the freedom to work in you. And you know what's going to happen when you live for him? There is no curse. There's blessing. But if you just continue to live with a disregard to God, it brings nothing but cursing. Which is why the first word of the New Testament is the word repent from John the Baptist. Last word of old, curse. First word of new, repent. 400 years in between, has anyone learned anything? The good news is we have today. Praise God. What are we going to do today? We're no different than these folks. We're no, we're no different. Yet, I think it's been pretty clear what God is calling us to do. What are you going to do with what God shared with you? Amen? Is that a good word? The minor prophet's been fun? I want to know fun is, is the appropriate word, so I'd grab a beer with any one of these guys. Now, whether I wanted to hear what they had to say, that's a whole different matter. But God is good. God is faithful. God is constant. Praise Him for His faithfulness. Amen? Next week, First John. It's going to get real practical when it comes to loving God and loving each other. It's going to be fun. Let's stand. Let's pray. Thank God for this time. Father, thank You for meeting us where we're at, for reminding us of your faithful, constant love. 
it, it truly staggers me that you would love such an, uh, an imperfect, mistake-prone creature like me. And yet, Lord, I delight in the fact that you remind me that it's never about performance. But it's always about position. That you've made me your son. And I delight in the fact that you are a God who blesses desire and not competency. And I think we can all say a hearty amen to that because we are so incompetent when it comes to the spiritual things and how we're called to live for your glory, Lord. Help us make sense of this on a day-to-day basis. Speak into our lives, because I know you're going to be faithful to do that. Guide our steps. May we be like the person in Psalm 1 whose feet are planted by the, the, the raging rivers, and but we're like that deep tree with deep roots. That no matter what comes along, we are a person who does not walk in the way of sinners nor in the path of scoffers, but our heart is the one that delights in the law of the Lord. And as we seek to delight in you, may those spiritual roots in our hearts dig down deep into confidence and contentment like never again in our life, never before. Have your way in us. Be glorified in us. And thank you for the word today. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. See you soon. Thanks for snatching up all those backpacks. You guys are awesome.